Right, welcome to the Womanizers Bible podcast number two. Okay, so I've got one under my belt. I am no longer the naive little lamb that I was last time. Um, I actually have a special guest with me right now. Special needs. Yeah, you'll you'll be familiar with uh, Tom Torero. He has his own channel, his own podcast. He's just recently come off the back of a 30-day vlog challenge of um explaining the balance between a nice guy and a bad boy which is going to be one of the topics addressed today so i'm not one for preamble so let's just jump right into it we have a question on my blog from teabag where he says this i'm confused by this post my nice guy bad boy fractionation post as it goes against what's often proposed, i.e. don't give mixed signals in what you're trying to do. One could say that you are giving mixed RK style signals by the above behavior, correct? How is that then not giving mixed signals in that she could see you as potential boyfriend material and therefore make you wait longer or a quick adventure fuck? Mm. Right then, so I believe this comes down to a misunderstanding and we're gonna go into this in some detail. I mean, it's quite a reasonable misunderstanding. So I say in Day Game Overkill that you should pick which part of the lover provider spectrum you want to be on, what suits you in terms of the type of girl you want, sort of relationship you want, and then make sure that all your signals point in that direction. Right. So for example, with me, I want to be presenting myself as the fast lay, either the alpha sport fuck on the extreme left end of the lover spectrum or one step along from that fuck buddies. That's what I'm going after. So I position myself that way in my look, in my attitude, in the decision making I make in the set. So that's the message of overkill is to pick where you want to be and don't give mixed signals. Now, here's where I think the misunderstanding comes in. I say don't give mixed signals about what you want. Mm -hmm. Right. What is the proposition you're giving the girl? Don't give a mixed signal of half of it is like you just want to take her into a bathroom and fuck her, while the other half is you want to date over the long term and hold hands and buy her roses, right? That's what I mean about mixed signals. It's mixed signals in your intention. It's mixed signals in what you want. That's completely different to fractionating elements of nice guy and bad boy, because that's about who you are. So... I put a tweet up um, quite recently. I'll see if I can find it so I can put the exact words. Bear with me one moment, dear reader. So this tweet is as follows. Alpha, Sigma, Beta is your mindset. Your SMV is a composite of real attributes, whereas lover provider is your identity in relation to women. So what does that mean? Well, when I talk about not mixing your signals, I mean, make it clear what you're after, which for me is a sport fuck or fast fuck. But the actual person who you are, that is fractionated. The actual game that you put in terms of the emotions that you put her through is fractionated. So I'll bring in Tom in a moment to discuss this. But first, I want to give you a, um, a metaphor. So I strongly recommend you read a book called Dangerous Men and Adventurous Women. You can get this on Amazon. It's edited by Jane Ann Krentz. That's Krentz, K-R-E-N-T-Z. Now what this is, it's a book from, I believe, late, no, 1992 it is, in which I think it is 10 different best-selling romance writers these are, you think of like the women's books, which have pictures of Fabio on the cover of, you know, of like some body stripping thing, yawn, a big muscular guy who's a pirate or a count or something like that. Some girl pressed up against them, right? Women's romance. It's a bunch of these writers and they are writing about how they make their books popular with the women. Like what is the stories that the women want? Um, what are the like plot developments? What are the arcs? And they all basically come down to the same thing, which if you've read Twilight, it's the same thing. It's always the same. You have a virginal woman who's had very little experience of the world, but has an adventurous spirit, which has not been capitalized on. And in, for some reason, she is betrothed or committed to some boring stand-up guy in the community who desperately wants to marry her, a nice guy. 
But she just feels that that's not for her. She's in some way trapped. She's like Cinderella in the kitchen doing the cleaning. And then, through a chance encounter, she will bump into a raging bad boy. Like, it will be like, if it's in the 1600s, it'll be like the count of the nearby county. Like, maybe she's carrying milk to the market while his um, carriage goes past and splashes our mud and knocks her milk over and he gets out and says something, right? So it'll be like the meat. And she will be overwhelmed by fear and attraction for this alpha bad boy who goes his own way. There'll be some sort of recognition. She'll make some kind of impression on him and then he'll be gone. And her time is gone. So then she'll go back to her boring life, sweeping the kitchen, and she'll be thinking to herself, like, she just can't get that out of her mind. She cannot get this meeting out of her mind. It was so exciting. He's this window into this other life that her nice guy, doctor guy she's betrothed to can't offer. So then she thinks nothing's going to happen, but lo and behold, sometime later, she meets this bad boy again. Another chance encounter. But now it goes somewhere. You know, she talks to him, he talks to her, and now the sexual tension really builds, and there'll be a seduction. The bad boy will seduce her. And normally he'll like either fuck her or come very close to it. And there'll be a lot of danger. She's very scared. She hopes nobody finds out. She's racked with guilt over the nice guy. But it's just it's too exciting. She can't help herself. And then suddenly they'll be pulled apart. The threat of having to marry the nice guy rears its head again. The bad guy gets into trouble and through her unique magical vagina, she somehow gets him out of trouble. She somehow shows her specialness to him and he decides to marry her. And then that's it. She marries him and she's going to tame him, right? That is like every romance ever. That's Fifty Shades of Grey. Right? It's everything ever. And it is all also a very nice little plot arc for what a same day lay looks like or what a long game lay looks like. So this book is fantastic because it's female writers, in their own words, basically telling you the meta narrative for a successful or selected pickup. It's telling you all about the secret society. So it's a great book. I recommend you read it. You can pick it up on Amazon. I'm looking at it now on the sales page. You can get used and new from 0.01 dollars. Right? It's fucking nothing. Right? So I recommend this. It's a good book. So. What is that coming into here? Like, before I rant on too much, I'll just ask Tom a bit of feedback on that. What do you think of that myth? How do you think it ties into what we're trying to do on Euro Jaunts or London Same Day Lays? And I mean, do, do you feel that that metaphor is applicable to what you do with girls? It's bang on, yeah. It's bang. I see it as, just as you were, you know, dwelling on that point, I see it as two dimensional versus three dimensional. And on the internet, it's very hard to convey three-dimensional. And those chick-lit kind of things and the Fifty Shades of Grey things, it's, it's 2D, yeah? And the guys that I meet, as I was talking to you today about when I say, oh, you know, have you read Crowder's stuff? Do you follow Crowder's blog? They have a very two-dimensional image of you. So you're portrayed as the bad boy. You know, you're amping that up much more than me. You've got the, you got the trinkets. You've got the leathers. It's your tone of writing. So they come to a logical conclusion, like a girl reading that book, that it's a, a 2D alpha character. So therefore, that's what your game is like. But I know your game very well because I've gamed with you for years and lived with you and travel with you. And that always makes me chuckle because the, the outer Krauser, the 2D Krauser is this uh, narrative portrayal of a bad boy. But the 3D version of Krauser that the girls get, you know, I've never slept with you, so I don't, I've never got this full image, mate, but... Um, I've seen you in set opening and it's definitely far more complicated, which is what we preach in terms of fractionation. And We've got another good metaphor we're going to go into on what is happening on the 3D level. Yeah, but for now, let's just say there's a 3D version of Krauser that's hard to portray unless you've met you or you've been to one of your seminars or you've, you've hung out with you for a bit because you, <laughs> I was joking over dinner that you kind of intimidate guys sometimes with your 2D version. Mm. I've but had what, people come to seminars and afterwards they were like oh i was scared to come i thought you were gonna like bully me or something yeah but it's the, funny. the recent stuff we did in prague and watching you every the first 30 seconds of every interaction i saw today i saw a lot of them it's something else is going on which is i, I think you're going to come onto this metaphor now and now here's the irony as well because your internet 2d image is the opposite side 
people think you're the nice guy yeah. and they underestimate the 3D of what what you're doing subtly, which they don't see. Years so ago. like we're much closer to yeah. each other in like final 3D thing. It's just my caricature is on the bad boy side and your caricature is on the nice guy side. And yeah. neither is true. We're actually yeah, much closer y- to years, each other. Years ago, you said to me, Tom, you're the wolf in sheep's clothing and people have called me, i.e. Krauser, the panda in the leather jacket, which is really that this is the topic of the podcast today, that yeah. there's a lot more going on. So that I can understand why guys are really confused because they're seeing you as like bad boy game, even like old school Croatian bad boy, if you get that reference. Hmm. Uh, but that ain't at all what you're doing on streets or like if people so can if people can hear you dating that is not i've heard your audio dates so let's talk about it so yep. the metaphor i'm going to introduce here something we were just chatting about over coffee today is this romance novel right what is that romance novel think of the woman who's sitting in her favorite chair by the fire with her slippers on a mug of cocoa tea you know a, a favorite like easy listener in the background she's reading a book right What's it, what is the situation? She's reading a book, right? She is putting herself into the fiction, but she knows she's reading a story, but this story she's reading is triggering all kind of emotions because that's what we do. You know, if you watch an action movie where Bruce Willis or Jason Statham, you put yourself into the drama of the hero, right? You enjoy his close scrapes and getting out just before the building explodes, you know, the tension of having the gun at his head and how is he gonna get out of this scrap, right? It's the nature of fiction is we put our, we suspend the disbelief and we put ourselves into it, we go with the flow, but we're never ever mixing fantasy and reality literally, like psychotics or people in Arkham Asylum would, right? We know we're watching a movie, we know we're reading a book, we're just allowing ourselves to be transported into that world. Now when the woman reads her Twilight, her Fifty Shades of Grey, whatever, on the tube in her room, Now, she knows she's just reading a story. She knows it's a performance. She's reading a script, right? Now, that is what we're giving the girls. So when we pick up a girl and we give her this whole day game spiel, we give her the text messages or the eye date, we take her on the date, we fuck her. Now, what we're really doing is we're handing her one of these books where she gets to be the main character. Now, she gets to step into this adventure So this is how we sweep her off her feet. We lift her out of the humdrum. We become the service provider of adventure sex. We are basically giving her a custom designed romance novel. It's a bit like those old fighting fantasy books of choose your own adventure, where you roll your dice and you have your little pencil. Uh, The the girls we're doing this on have not yet experienced this. So we're often, they're one, perhaps they've had one before, but it's usually we're their first chance to live out 50 shades of gray certainly in this live depth. yeah they get this... a micro version if they get pulled out of a nightclub that's a little yeah. small mcdonald's cheeseburger version of yeah. this we're offering another full stick we're offering her the street interaction the dirty text messages like a very um aggressively sexual date and then a fast pull so this is happening on girls that have wanted to live out the fantasy but they've never been able to and then we turn up in their town and they're like Oh, Jesus, is happening. What is the other metaphor we get? Another metaphor we had is, you know, you get these murder mystery weekends where you all get tickets and a script and you go off to a country house and you all dress up in tuxedos and then you play a live action game where you all have roles and there's a murderer and you've all got to, like, talk to each other. It's like living an Agatha Christie story. Mm. It's, right? the, it's I know that you know that I know. Yeah. So that's essentially what we're giving these girls is we're handing them a script they're the main character and they have this amazing opportunity to live the dream basically we're offering it and they cannot create this for themselves the guys who are pulling them off floor nightclub dance floors that's just a well maybe lesser is perhaps like patting ourselves on the back too much but that's like a micro short version of what we offer it doesn't have the same depth so we're giving them this now so the girls know The girls know that there's a certain unreality about this. And the big thing where the fractionation comes into it is in the book, in the script, in the shared role play fantasy that we're doing, we're bad boys. However, as the guy who is sitting next to her in the theater, watching the stage, as it were, watching ourselves on stage, we're the nice guy. So she always feels like she has a pause button. And I think it's a bit like when you watch a lion playing with its cubs. 
right? If you imagine where the line she's the cub, right? The cub's jumping around and the line's cuffing her around and like swatting them down and things like that. But the cub always knows that because the line's his dad, he's never in danger. It is, it's just a simulation of a fight. Now the, the cubs love like hanging onto his ears and his mane and like whacking him with their paws and stuff. And the line just cuffs them back. And there's this safety net underneath where the girl knows at any moment if it gets out of hand, she can hit the pause button. Oh. You know, she gets a bit of the nice guy again. And then when she's ready, and this is a skill of calibration, you press play again and you go back into the fantasy, right? But you have your little intermissions. And that's part of the um, part of the fun is she gets her little intermissions to take a deep breath, go to the toilet, look at herself in the mirror like, Jesus, this is really happening. And then she gets back into the fantasy again. So the, a lot of the nice guy fractionation is about giving this girl the safety net that she's not really going to be dragged off and raped somewhere. Yeah, because she, she's not going to meet these Heathcliff characters in real life. They're not real. It's funny when guys quote either movies or novels as examples of good game, even Californication. We always nag guys, well, that's written by a scriptwriter and a producer. The, so the he, compliance has been written in. The, the guy's yeah. success has been written in by the scriptwriter. Yeah, if you know Wuthering Heights, how fucking scary would it be to actually meet Heath, Heathcliff and have him pin you against the wall if you're a girl? Yeah, so... We were talking today about the move. It's a player move where you, just to test or to show the girl that you're sexually aggressive and that, you know, this is this is not friendly. You kiss her and you either put your thumb in her mouth as you're kissing her and, like, stro like grabbing her side of her face or you gently just, like, press your hand around her throat in a dominant move and 99.999% of women absolutely love it. So... Like a true movie bad boy would do that in an outrageous burst of energy in the back alley and she would have no chance to say no and it would be highly flammable and dangerous. Like the very fine line that that could go horribly wrong for her. But with me and you, it's a calibrated move. There's actually micro steps. Like my choking technique with girls when I kiss them, there's about four different steps I do of gradually escalating terror and at every moment, I'm watching her reaction. And if she doesn't like it, I back up immediately. Yeah, we ain't gonna, you're not going to do that for real if, it, if a girl's saying no. Um, so, so it's, it's simulated. It's, it's the simulated dangerous man. And she gets to simulate being the adventurous woman. Yeah. But the good thing about that is these good girls fall into the role. They fall into the adventurous woman role because it's oh, what they've read about and they love it. And it's, it's playing directly to their needs. But it's also hardwired, isn't it? That mm. this is, you're tapping into the hind brain, you could say, if you believe in the three-part brain model, you know, the animal brain, where finally her brain gets to, like, the logical part shuts off. She she taps into that, like, primeval DNA thing going on, and surprise, surprise, she feels, like, super feminine. You get these really weird spazzing out reactions, and surprise, surprise, you feel like a fucking boss. Now, here's mm. the interesting thing we were talking about having lunch. Like, you don't, I don't walk around, you don't walk around life in a leather jacket with all your trinkets on, thinking you're like some not when fucking, I'm at home I don't. not when you're yeah when you're with your your family or you're out doing your normal thing you're not in day game mode you're not on a holiday you're not in that mode but as we put on our gear and go out and do our day game yeah whoever it's asks like this a question, costume for the performance yeah right? you're right who i forgot who answered this question teabag yeah teabag but you're right mate you're not sending mixed signals you're doing day game in this uh adventure sex lover mode in the set, in the texting, and on the date, it's highly intelligent, subtle, uh, and calibrated. And it's hard to show. You know, we, I've tried to do audios of it, but it's very hard to show nuances of what's going on. Even, something, a, even a video doesn't show something's it. Something's just come to my mind here. As I was thinking, like your concept, Elephant in the Room, and my concept, which I pulled off John, um, Fourth Walling, that is letting her know it's a play. It what is the like, elephant yeah, of the room? Yeah. The elephant in the room, like, for example, what I was saying today were girls, is at the end I was saying, look, I think you're very pretty, I'd like to take you out for a drink. And a couple of them were like, oh, well, i got a boyfriend. And I was like, look, I don't want to be your boyfriend, I'm not mm. that kind of guy. She's ah, ha, 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 uh, maybe. And I was like, look, I will try to seduce you. Yeah. Or now, I say, I, I, if, if something's fucking up, I go, look, you're making it very hard for me to seduce you here. That is what is it Brecht? Is it that weird like the fourth, fourth wall? wall? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. what that's doing, if you think of this metaphor we're talking about about the dangerous man and the adventurous woman playing the choose your own romance novel, what we're reminding her that 
we're giving her this novel, right? That that it is a role play. That we're offering her this journey, and we both know that it is a suspension of disbelief. So the fourth wall, the elephant in the room, we're just reminding her that we're not really Heathcliff. We're yeah. offering her her Heathcliff experience, yeah. but we are not Heathcliff. Right? And somehow, on a very deep limbic level, women just get this. Yeah. In Overkill, do you go into your like, into your ridiculous? Um... What dating? What the surreality I do? There's the no sur- dating in Overkill. It's pure street stop. The, in the street stop, the first thirty seconds to a minute, the stacking when you go into this uh, this weird second universe of kind of Monty Pythonish, like that again. Guys that know you, the two D version of you, think that you do this kind of aggressive, just grabbing her and pulling her into a park yeah, toilet. Not true. But like, if you know, if you've watched Overkill or you've seen enough of Nick live, yeah, well, there's a good Overkill set where I accuse her of being like Cinderella, and I run this Cinderella fantasy. You know, I accuse her t- uh, jacket of being like a TV that's not tuned in properly in a certain my eyes. Yeah, it's like surreal. It's surreal and it's soft. This mm. is what I mean. You've done posts on this, surely. Soft mm. dominance. Yeah, that's one of your yeah, do you things. Do you want to talk about that a bit? The soft uh, guys miss a trick here. If you don't know what soft dominance is, you need to like, like can they find it easily? Yeah, on your soft just search soft dominance. You will find it. Yeah, that answers this question, actually. And if you want a quick answer to this question and you don't want to listen to this podcast anymore, search soft dominance because it's a, it's a caricature of hard dominance, which is pretty scary. You wouldn't like to be at the other end of that if you were a girl. Uh, what we're doing is like playful soft dominance. So she feels the sexual threat. You look like a sexual threat. Uh, you are going to fuck her, so she does get fucked um, in this kind of fantasy way but you're weaving it in with intellectual mastery, storytelling, creativity. One of Nick's strengths is <laughs> surreal verbal bamboozling. It's very hard to teach. It's very hard to mirror because you need to be... You do that. You tend to do it more as role play, though. You do comedy role play, don't you? Yeah, that's something I learned. But it's, it's serving the same purpose. It's the same purpose. It's showing her that, well, I don't look as immediately bad as you, <laughs> but it softens what you're doing because there was this wave of popularity about three and a half years ago in London where guys came up with this magical idea that you just go up to a girl and you're verbally super sexual and guys were like shit that's the holy grail man just tell a girl you want to fuck her and that's going to work whereas very quickly you realize that that doesn't work so you soften it so you sub communicate like hello I want to fuck you and you wrap it up we say, like, all the good seducers we know, and if we can class ourselves as good seducers, you wrap it up in, like, this childlike, innocent fantasy bamboozling. And it, um, yeah, you're like the naughty little kid who touches the waitress's ass when he's on the family meal yeah, or something, right? it gets away with it because it's soft. But everything about it is, I want to fuck you right now. Uh, uh, if you've tried this, going up to girls in London and being, like, full-on alpha, I want to fuck you right now, well, please let me know your success rate below. Mm-hmm. It's very fucking low. So th- I think the way we deal with it, the way Nick counterbalances this quite aggressive persona, which mm-hmm. you might believe Nick is, is to have this other side. But it's very hard to to teach and spot if you don't know what you're looking for. Do you want to talk for? a bit about how... Because what it does is it's very three-dimensional. Get back to the original term is... I think a lot of people underestimate the depth of what's really going on in Advanced Day Game. Right? It's um, like a metaphor I use in Overkill, and I think you were talking about a similar one today, is it's like watching two swimmers. Right? It's like one guy can swim, and like say Ian Thorpe or Michael Phelps or something, and he just has beautiful technique. He goes from one end of the pool to the other, really fast, really efficient, getting somewhere. Another guy jumps in, just thrashes around, his head's bobbing underwater, and he just goes nowhere. Now, to the uninitiated, they're both in the water, they're both getting wet. But it's just not the same thing. One guy's thrashing around, nearly drowning, the other guy's going somewhere. And why? Because Michael Phelps and Thorpe, they learnt the strokes, right? And they know how to do it really well. So, advanced day game, when you do it right, it's very, very deep. Like, I think the intermediate guys listening to this will really get this. The beginners maybe don't, because you're still struggling to comprehend the model and see what's really happening, but... One of the great joys of day game, which I love um, for my own personality, is just knowing how deep it is. Watching a craftsman at work, whether it's Tom or it's some of our mates, other people. I mean, there's not many of them, especially on YouTube. But if, you, if you're if you an intermediate guy and you watch an advanced guy, it's fucking lovely to watch. It's like a tennis fan watching Federer or Nadal. It's, there's a lot going on. What, what was your concept of match pairs or... 
I mean, th- this does link to the the old game concept of push pull. Push pull mm. is what exactly what we're talking about, really, in some way. On a very kind of meta form. level, it's a meta push pull. Yeah. Like it's an identity push pull. Yeah. There's a meta frame. Pu- there's. It's, yeah. That's what I mean. It's deep. Old school Tyler, if you know Tyler, talks about giving girls this like palette of emotions, the full rainbow of emotions. So that is a health warning that if you're thinking of game as like two dimensional, okay, you wear a leather jacket, you hit on her, you try and fuck her in a toilet, you're not at all giving her a mixed range of emotions. And I've listened to audios of Nick on a date, obviously because yeah, I've never dated Nick, and Nick's heard many of me, and we were like, holy, remember last year? Yeah, so in we Russia, do the same thing. Like, oh shit, that? we're doing the same thing. We're giving them like weird bits of intellect, we're telling them fantasy stories, we're giving them humour. We're giving them periods of loads of words, periods of silence. Yeah. You know, we're fractionating that. We're fractionating yeah. sitting down, we're moving. Like yeah. there's so many different levels of fractionation. It's not I it sounds pretty like we're arrogant now that we're just going, oh, we're fucking I am amazing. arrogant, I don't well, mind. I am. Well, good, yeah, I hope you release the audios, man. I mean, even I, when I listen back to my date audios, you think there's a lot more going on than you can teach because the purpose of me teaching guys is simplifying concepts. So by its very nature, the, day, the London day game model is, is very simplified, it's very linear. And I was trying to nag guys last year and you tried to nag guys in mastery mm. that it's uh, polyphonic. But yeah, this has generated confusion because that's not a healthy, easy teaching model. Right, so because we're running out of time, I'll uh, wrap this up. So underneath the tea bags question, a commenter called Wake answered, well, I thought it was a very good answer. And he says to tea bag, the very essence of attraction springs up from a contrast between the feminine and the masculine, between the disciplined and the wild, the refined and the rough, etc. That is the foundation of seduction and of this specific aspect Krauser's highlighting. Now, I absolutely agree. I wrote about this in, um, I think it was chapter two of Mastery when I talked about my matched pairs and bouncing between them. Tom simplified it in Badass Buddha to be about on and off. But we're, we're talking about the same thing. So um, to go back to T-Bag's original question about is it mixed signals? What is it we're trying to do here? So you do not give mixed signals about what you want. You make it very clear. I prefer covertly with only a little bit of over. You make it very clear where you are on that lover provider spectrum, which box you want her to put you into, you know, what proposition are you giving her? And you don't have to be the alpha sport fucker. You might just be looking for a girlfriend. But that has no mixed signals. What gets inaccurately called mixed signals is what wake is talking about is fractionation and what we've just discussed in this show which is about this entire emotional palette about having what might be a little bit of a 2d caricature bad boy in the novel that she gets to play this roles and then fractionating that giving it depth by the both of you know that this is a performance that you're cooperating on and that is why you'll often get girls afterwards when you've taken them on this whole journey and they've had their little indiscretion with you, right? Because they're not bad girls. You just put them on this um, journey. And at the end of the journey, when the drum rolls, the uh, curtains close, she often wakes up and she gets that really familiar thing that every intermediate day gamer chuckles about. It's just like, how did I get here? Uh, wh- why am I here? I don't normally do this. What did I just do? Why am I in your bedroom? Eh? What happened? You get this confusion because the movie's ended and everyone's filing out the auditorium. Now, she's really glad she saw the movie, but she's kind of aware it ended. And perhaps you can talk about this, Tom, as well, is you often get a bit of blowback. Like, one thing I've noticed with girls is you do that, they like it, and then often on the next date, they won't even kiss you because they're trying to recover their identity of good girl because they can't quite square. I mean, I'll give you an example. There's a girl I fucked in February an Argentine girl. She was actually a virgin. Um, she came back to my place on the first date, but it was on a period. She, on the second date, I brought her back and fucked her. And, uh, you know, I went through this period of giving her this whole adventure over a macro frame. I've been dating this girl on and off for a year now. Now, after about a month or a month or two months, I can't remember exactly when, but I'd already, like, done anal with her. I'd um, got out to lick my ball. She actually said to me, we're sitting in Pizza Hut. Uh, no, not Pizza Hut, Pizza Express. Uh, oh, I see. Yeah. And she was sitting opposite the table. She's like, Nick, I'm worried. And I was like, why is that? She's like, well, you see, um, I really like anal and I enjoyed licking your balls. Like, so I'm worried. Does that make me a slut? 
No, she actually said this. It was hilarious. Right? Like, I really like the skill. And she was, and this is the sort of thing she'd occasionally say. So she'd been like racked in her personal identity. It's like if you're a good guy and you do something bad and you're yeah. trying to square it away, like, am I a bad guy or yeah. am I really a good guy? She was doing this on the good girl, bad girl. She was like, she was like, look, everything I've ever read, you know, all my friends, all them, they say that if you if you're a girl who likes it up the ass, you're a slut. Mm. And I was saying, I look like you were a virgin when I met you. I'm the only guy you've ever fucked. Believe me, no one's going to accuse you of being a slut. Mm. But girls have this whole identity issue after one of these adventures where she's had her indiscretion. It's completely out of character, although it's hardwired into her. And now she has to reconcile that with who she is and what she's getting, plus all the familiar emotions of now she really fancies you. So girls will often get really cranky for a while after that. Some of them will drop off forever. And then some of them will come back and you get some sort of normalised relations. So I wondered what your thoughts were on that, Tom. Well, here's a, the caveat of the nice bad boy. The caveat of the nice bad boy is that you not only get the adventure sex with her, you, yeah, you get a bit of blowback, she, you get the anti-slut thing, uh, you get the silence. It's like when they find out about what I do or they find a YouTube video or they find a book or something, you get like, a bit of anger, of course. But here's the, here's the disclaimer. Because you've mixed in on the date and even on the street and in your texting you've shown that you're this 3d intelligent creative kind of interesting guy you can't get rid of these girls they're like they're addicted to you because they get the kind of crack cocaine hit of uh, you grabbing them and <laughs> me pushing her head out the window with uh, with her consent not through the window <laughs> not through the window sometimes you wish you could through unless she's disobedient <laughs> yeah um they get a thrill the dangerous thrill but they get this they get an enjoyable date, hopefully. I'm giving them an enjoyable date and they get, you know, an enjoyable time with you. So a true bad boy, like a, like a criminal bad boy or the a mythical novel bad, bad boy, the, the ones that don't really boy, even exist. Yeah. That is a pump and dump. That's the same day lay, same night lay, never seen again. And she doesn't want to see him again because she's not disgusted, but she's shocked by her behavior and there's nothing nothing in it for her to see to see you again. So... Uh, it's a double win, really, if you want to keep these girls around. In general, your girls and my girls do stick around, and then yeah. it's a kind of a nice problem to have that you can't get rid of them when they're on Facebook and they're, they're hassling you for more adventure sex. But um, here's, a, here's just one practical tip that I would... I did stick on the end of the vlog thing because I felt a bit guilty that I'm giving mixed signals to guys about, OK, be a bit nice, but be a bit bad. For the first year or two with Day Game be bad or at least caricature being bad uh, I wasted too much time trying to do the Hugh Grant thing Nick was a good lesson in early London day game formation of the model that we badly was... calibrated but at least yeah. it was the right direction but he was right? going in the opposite way we used to, we met Nick and he was like calibrated in the opposite way of like feeling their tits after 20 seconds Burning and shit everything. And <laughs> just, just going on an eye date and then trying to fuck up the ass in a loo or something you know just way off, but to the opposite spectrum of me being the boyfriend, the four or five date shit. So parody the bad boy. So go go and get the leather jacket, go and get some rings, watch some alpha quote-unquote movies, parody it until you're getting the responses where the girl's calling you like a dick, a player, a rude. She thinks that you're rude over texts. You're kind of, you know, you're going too far physically and you lose some girls... And that'll do you the world of good. And we learned that, right, even when we used mm. to read people like Six Years of Challenge, that's that's just going to shave off, what, a year, two years? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's permanent. You reach a certain... So you, just, you reach a certain flexing of your muscles, which just permanently increases your range. It yeah. permanently increases the range of your game, I think. And then you'll swing back to the old you, and you'll end up talking about your old hobbies and shit. Um, well, that's a nice place to be in. Okay, so we're going to nip this one in the bud now. So this was all about mixed signals, the nice guy, bad boy balance. So thank you, T-Bag, for your question which triggered this. I hope this answer um, tells you what you wanted to know. And again, and thank you, Mr. Wake. Ironically, the video game I'm playing right now is called Alan Wake. Uh, there you go. Nice bit of synchronicity. So thanks for your answer as well. And uh, we will see you next time. Don't forget to subscribe because I'm going to be very negligent in announcing future podcasts on my blog. Bye.